Welcome to Candy Start. I have a fabulous panel here right in front of us of property tax experts. Now, I'm sure you all are like me. We just got our tax bill in the mail shortly, uh, probably five or so days ago. I left it in the kitchen. I didn't want to look at it. I made my husband look at it first. I've been hearing that people have been collapsing when they've been getting their bills because they're huge. I am actually also running for Dallas City Council. Here's my, my little shirt right here. I'll just show you Candy Evans for Dallas City Council. And every single homeowner I'm talking to is talking about property taxes. And we're hearing my opponent is saying, and some of the other candidates are saying, you know what, we've had the biggest tax cut in Dallas the city of Dallas in 40 years. And I'm not feeling it, no one's feeling it. And here today, we're gonna to talk about that, that property taxes, what's wrong with them, how we all need to protest them, how you can do it yourself or how you can go to some experts to do it. But we're gonna learn the tools that we have to do because guess what? We all have to be armed to do this if we live in the state of Texas. Is that not right, guys? You said it. You got it. That's absolutely right. Thank you. So <laughs> let me start with Glenn. Do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Glenn Goodrich. Um, I run the firm propertytax.io. Um, that's actually our domain, www.propertytax.io. And we represent um, homeowners lower their property tax every year. So that's what that's what we do. Thanks for having us here, Candy. Thank you for coming. And uh, down below we have Will. I'm gonna go that way and come to the center first, <laughs> back <laughs> to Jim. There's Will Wiggins. Thank you, Candy. Thanks for having me, Glenn. Thanks for your invitation. Yeah, same. Uh, Will Wiggins. I'm with North Texas Property Tax Service. We've been around since 2003. Uh, we specialize in Dallas and the northern counties uh, in Dallas, DFW, so Collin and Denton and uh, in Dallas and Tarrant, of course. Uh, and uh, same thing. We like to help people lower the property taxes and assist them however we can to uh, sort of relieve some of that burden you're talking about. Perfect. And last, but of course not least, is Jim Goodrich. And you will notice there's a similar last name here going on because we have father and son. We have a duo fighting property taxes. So Jim, introduce yourself and we'll take it off. Yes. Guess which one I am, father or the son. So I'm Jim Goodrich and I am a real estate appraiser. been uh, in the Dallas area for 30 plus years and also Glenn's partner with propertytax.io. I happen to do the commercial protest and Glenn usually has more than he can handle, so I help him out with the residential as well. So I'll be your moderator today. So I've got the easy part. I've got to pitch these guys questions, and uh, I think you're going to be in for a real treat today. I really do. So terrific. Well, so first of all, while we're all picking ourselves up off the floor, why do we have such high property taxes in Texas? They this is one of the highest states, by the way. You know, people come here, they move right. here, and they say, "Oh my God, your your real estate is so affordable." Then they're hit with the shockeroo of the property taxes. Yeah, I saw that article that um, Candy Start published, I guess, a few weeks ago that cited another uh, publication, I guess, about how uh, Dallas area is like one of the worst places for taxes in the country. And I mean, I think that sums up exactly why you're seeing a big battle in Austin right now, legislatively between the House and the Senate, because I mean, uh, you know, our property tax system was designed, you know, years, you know, decades ago, whenever we weren't seeing, you know, 20% increases in value year over year. And so the tax bills are relatively in check and um, it's, it's gotten out of hand. And um, now we need to kind of change our system, which, you know, our, our lawmakers are looking at doing now, but um, I mean, also just a vast majority of people don't even protest their value. So there's there's two parts of the equation. There's the value and the rate. And we have power, some power over the value of our property. And so more people need to be engaged in that part of the process. And we're going to focus a lot of what we're talking about today on on the, the protest part of the process. But Candy, you know, you're running for for city council and you're you're hopefully going to be in charge of the rates part of the conversation so we can get into that a little bit too because i mean that's that's becoming increasingly more and more important chop 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 so yeah. thank you thank you for answering that i think that you're right when this when the system was designed homes were way more affordable here right yeah I bet Jim offer has can offer some insight onto that because I know when I moved here, homes were a lot more affordable. Well, they were, and I would just kind of tag on to what Glenn said. You know, we had some uh, really landmark legislation two years ago in the Texas legislature called Senate Bill 2, and that really put a lot of checks and balances on a property tax system. Um, we haven't really seen the full effect of that, uh, but I will say 
I just got through doing a class this morning and we, we talked about property taxes and rates being a teeter totter. When one goes up, the other one goes down. That's not showing up real well, but when the values go way up uh, legislatively, the tax rates have to go down because there are limits on what the cities and schools can actually take in now. So we've got a really, a pretty good system. We just need to give it a chance to, to let it work. And uh, I think that's what Dan Patrick's position is. And there's other, other schools of thought as well. You know, Candy, uh, Will actually has probably interesting perspective on this because Will, you used to work with the appraisal districts, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I started in uh, land land development and planning in, where I came from in Colorado and moved into assessment when I moved down to Texas about 10 years ago. I uh, got a job working as a, as a commercial uh, appraisal uh, for Travis Central Appraisal District, and I was promoted into an analyst manager and all the way up to assistant director at Travis Central there in Austin. So became very familiar uh, with not with the Texas style, I suppose, of assessment. And I guess I'll just answer that question too, Candy, that I when I got down here, a little tidbit or, or kind of a, um, it was funny, a story to me, uh, anecdotal, but um, when I came down to Texas, I thought that Texas, you know, having, being born in Texas and growing up, my whole family coming from Texas, I thought was a relatively conservative state. Well, when I found out that they got 8%, that the taxing entities were allowed to go up to 8% increases on their budgets without a hearing, I, was, I, I thought, well, that's incredible. I, that's, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of increase. And even where I came from in Colorado, it was limited to uh, population and inflation or, or capped at five, you know, so you could have those two, but we're going to cap you at five. And that even came from Colorado. I came down here and thought, golly, they get 8%, huh? That's a, that's a lot. And uh, so anyway, to see to see the most recent legislation cap it at 3% without a hearing, I think that's the right call. And I'm looking forward to seeing how compression works. Okay. Do you, any of you ever think that, that we might, first of all, let me backtrack. Is this an equitable system? Is it equitable for homeowners? Or do you think there's more of a burden on homeowners than there are? There's commercial property. I, I mean, look, there's way more data for residential properties out there than there is commercial, like through the MLS systems. And a lot of people don't know this, but the appraisal districts have access or so, a lot, most of them have access to the MLS system. So they know what properties are selling for. There are systems like that for commercial, like CoStar, but um, nobody really inputs in sale prices into CoStar. So they have a lot more data to work with for residential. They get pounded as a general rule. I say that residential properties pay you know, 95% or higher of their market value and commercial properties pay like 70% of their market value. So in that regard, it's not equitable uh, for homeowners. And just, you have issues now. I mean, there's kind of a, it's not really funny, but I, I'm, for lack of a better word, I call it a joke that um, there's a, I, there's this new exemption that exists, which is I've, I've owned my home for more than three years exemption. And that's because you, you've been somewhat protected by the caps with these huge increases. If you purchased your property in the past three years, people are wondering, well, how did my value go up by more than 10%? And that's because when you purchase your property, you're not eligible for that 10% cap the year after the purchase. So if you've recently purchased your home, your values, your, your taxable value is going to be way higher than people that have owned their home for more than three years because they've been somewhat protected by that 10% cap. So in that regard, it's really not equitable either. For every time you buy a property, you're losing cap protection and now you're paying more. So it, it's, we got some issues we got to work out with equity in our system for sure. Yeah. That, and I'm, I'm really interested. <clears throat> Guys, you want to chime in? Yeah, I'll take the yeah. one, but I'll, I'll keep it short for sure, Jim. Uh, I know you probably have some comments too, but uh, one thing too, Kenny, I, I'd, I'd say is that when I became a director, it was kind of like I got the big picture. I thought I was a big shot for being a commercial appraiser and knowing how to value things on income and what, how to, how to do a band of investment for cap rates. And that is all fun stuff for appraisal. And I do love that stuff. And I love those studies. But when I became the assistant director, Travis, I, I realized, holy cow, the tax basis is residential by far. Like the people paying the taxes are in the homes. They're not in the commercial. So, so to me, the discussion of taxes is only ever about the homeowners. And, um, and that's where it should stay. I mean, I think the commercial guys, commercial real estate investors get a pretty good deal with some of the laws that are in place. And to answer your question, I absolutely, I'll tell you this, Texas is one of the only five states that has a provision to protect the taxpayer against unfair taxation. And, and that's huge. I mean, we just really need to cradle that and make sure that that stays in place because it's in jeopardy with things like caps, as, as Glenn mentioned. We gotta, you know, Texans believe that we are taxed according to value. 
And anything that takes away from that, anything that takes away from the pursuit of, of what the value is, uh, needs to be it needs to be challenged for sure. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Jim, you had yeah. you had one to add to that. Um, I don't really have anything to add, really. I think they covered it pretty well. Uh, I just want to mention to Will, maybe um, somebody chatted in so they couldn't hear you very well. So oh. maybe just speak up a tad more. I can hear you just fine, but okay. uh, just keep that in mind. Okay. I or maybe get closer to the microphone, maybe. <laughs> I can do that. You bet. <clears throat> so I didn't, I didn't really have anything to add, really, to that, Candy. I think, I think they're pretty well covered. Uh, residential, for sure, is easier to value. Uh, and I think I agree with Glenn that they cover um, much more, pay much more of their fair share than commercial. I happen to do commercial protesting for people, and it's not uncommon to see a sale, a property sale for one and a half times, maybe even two times what, what it's on the tax rolls for. Just well, because and it's also, much harder, the data sources are not out there. Well, and also the commercial firms, the commercial properties are all represented by agents mm -hmm. and a lot, and they're, and they're constantly protesting every year and through those firms. And a lot of homeowners are unrepresented or they're not filing their own protest. And so there's that regard also that it's a business operation for the commercial properties and for homeowners, it's more of like, do I feel like protesting this year or not? And it, it, I think we're in a point in time where it's just, we need to be protesting every year and keeping those value, the value part of the equation in check with the appraisal district and not just rubber stamping what they think the value is. Because the commercial properties hire professionals like us to, to challenge that value every year aggressively. Right, that's written into their business plan. That's not written into every homeowner's business plan. Right. But one of the things we try to do at Candy Sturt and what we wanna do with today's seminar, um, webinar is that we wanna give you the tools to do it yourself because you don't have to hire a professional. You can do it yourself, but we'll give you the tools for that. So onward and upward. Okay, so guys, what's the next step here with, uh, should we talk about what's going on in Austin right now? Yeah, we can well, do we, Let's cover it. Yeah. Go ahead, Dad. Go ahead, sure. Jim. Yeah, we have uh, we have been talking about that a little bit. There's basically two competing versions. There's the House version. It's not, it's just funny. It's not Republican versus Democrat. It's House <laughs> versus Senate. Yes. And uh, yeah. the, the Senate is 100% behind their proposition, which is to raise the homestead exemption for schools from hmm. 40,000 to 70,000, which will help all homeowners. Uh, another exemption for seniors. And there's some other fine points that, that are probably more in the weeds than we want to get. Uh, and then the House has got um, something that's kind of interesting. Uh, they, they are proposing a 5% cap on all real estate, including land, commercial buildings, uh, houses, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I've heard that described as it's kind of like cotton candy. It, it looks really good and it tastes really good, but it's bad for you. So I'll just leave it at that and, and let Will and Glenn comment further on that. And Candy, I'd be interested in what your comments are too. Yeah, well, go ahead. So are you guys, are you on the same page with that or what do you think? Yeah, I, with the cotton candy, yeah, I, I did a, I wrote a memo and I called it the, uh, I called it the garden, uh, apple in the garden uh, as, as it looks, it looks really good, but uh, it actually is really bad. And so uh, the whys, again, I'll stay out of the weeds of it as well. I can just tell you that, um, uh, if we if we are concerned about fairness in taxation, uh, as the Constitution of, of Texas, uh, you know, is fervent about, and people, I, I know people are concerned about that. Then this this may look good right now, but it turns really bad. If you ever want to move, or if you care about, you know, again, you know, the the common. If you care about the common, and there it is. I mean, if you are um, one of the residential, as I say then um, it, it's important that the, the only hope that we have of paying fair taxes is just that, that the appraisal districts get it right and that they value things correctly and people pay. The, I, don't, I don't think people have a problem paying their fair share, but when but when things get out of whack in, in the same product is paying half of the taxes as somebody that's just like them, it promotes uh, sort of a distrust in the public. And I think we really need to stay away from that. We need, really need to ascribe to you know, quality appraisals from the appraisal district. So instead, they should be pointed towards more, more, uh, more quality control and and uh, making sure that appraisal districts are held accountable, uh, rather than dipping fingers and taking away from fair market value. I, I'm I'm a fair market value purist for sure. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Oh. I would I would yeah. just add that you know we were talking about ec inequity between commercial and residential, and you know there's an old saying that in legislation there's no there's just trade offs, you know like there's really no just clear cut great answer to something. You're always 
you know, trading off one thing for another. And I mean, if you're going to talk about 5% caps across the board for commercial and residential, who do you think the winners of that proposal are going to be? Hmm. It's going to be the commercial property owners that are already, you know, aggressively pursuing reductions and getting good deal. So I just, and, and, and if we're talking about radically changing our, our tax system with the 5%, where's the financial study to prove that that benefits um, families and homeowners? You know, there is no financial study because they can't prove it. So it's it, it was very premature to even propose this on the House floor. It's it's one of those things like, it, again, we will, I'll say it again in a different way. It sounds great, but there's there's no substance to it. And it actually hurts homeowners. And they try. So I, 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 so I like the Senate bill. I like the Senate bill. Yeah. But, well, they tried this in California, too. And California does have lower property taxes than we do, though. They do. But you know who goes after that system is unfair is the progressives. They say that, you know, businesses don't sell their properties nearly as often as residential property owners do. A, a, a commercial property will sell, I mean, maybe maybe never in your lifetime mm -hmm. um, or just, maybe every 20 years. So I mean, go ahead, Will. Go well, ahead. I was just going to comment that, you know, when we go by comparison on California, you got to keep in mind, too, that they're in a, a serious deficit as well. And they also they also have an income tax. And that is not those are other big issues that, you know, are not, you know, we, we don't. That's the thing is, if it ain't if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And we're running out of surplus right now. So uh, yeah. let's let and the problem yeah. is not limiting. I mean, if you want to control taxes, you control it on the budget side, uh, because because what's left is valuation and valuations should be fair and equal in this case. And, and I don't think I don't think anybody looks at California and says, let's do it that way. In <laughs> fact, they're looking at that and being like, oh, let's learn the lessons of what they've done wrong. Yeah. 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 And I don't know why we're doing this. I don't know why the, the House Republicans decided to look at California and be like, let's do something along those lines. It makes no sense. I know. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the Senate bill, because that's the one it, I think you guys all agree that one's pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah, and I'll, I'll go first here. You want to start to jump in there. But the thing is, and some of the critique is that uh, you'll hear again is that it's regressive, right? And, and we know that it's so it's got a flat tax component to it and that there's a, a, a level benefit and that helps a guy that's in a $200,000 home, a $70,000 exemption is really helpful. Well, again, that's the majority. I, I'm, you know, let's keep in mind here that that is 95%, if you will, of, you know, that of that residential tax base. And those are the Texans that we're talking about. So if it helps them, great, you know, no, no problem. And, and if, and, and frankly, you know, for the others, it's still the same amount. So there's still that element of being fair. You're still getting the same amount of exemption, even though it might not affect yours, you know, at your million dollar home as much. Again, I, I think I think there's a fairness component to it that that is much more easier for me to to uh, digest than than the calamity of of the variance in cap values. Hey, Candy, I saw a question about this in our chat. If you want to ask it real quick, it's like, why is it bad to limit the increase to 5%? What am I not understanding here? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't think we fully have addressed valuation, taxable values, just one side of the equation. The, by law, like the city, let's just take ISD, for example, okay, DISD, Dallas, Dallas School District. By law, they can increase their revenue by 2.5% every year. Okay, and that, that means they can take their taxable value and they decide on a tax rate and whatever that tax rate decides to be, they're gonna they're gonna take last year's revenue and add two and a half percent to it. Okay. So you if we add five percent cap, all we're doing is decreasing the taxable value. Well, they're just gonna increase the tax rate to offset that. Right. So your tax bill has no impact at all by by limiting the taxable value. And you gotta understand that what's proposed is not just a five percent on your homestead, it's five percent on across the board, commercial and residential. So now you're just going to start giving benefit to commercial property, which is going to shift more of the tax burden What's to homeowners. Mm -hmm. I see. So that. it's it's yeah. So it's it's five. The five percent cap only addresses one side of the equation: taxable value. It does nothing to rein in the budgets with with the taxing entities that Senate Bill Two that went into effect in 2020 did. So they're just going to offset that taxable value suppression with an increase in the tax rate, and it's going to have a net no effect going to be one of those things that feels good when it passes, but it does absolutely nothing for your tax bill. And except for hurt it, because now commercial owners are going to see the benefit from a cap. Interesting. Someone else is, is asking thoughts on Colin Central Appraisal District not using the closing disclosure as acceptable method to add yeah. assets value. Can you guys just talk about that? Why don't you take that, Will? Sure. Yeah. Well, it's the first time I'd, I'd seen uh, an appraisal review board or a, 
appraisal district for that matter sort of uh, disregard uh, a, a fair market or an arm's length transaction and and sort of take claim to uh, the time adjustments and and sort of evoke in the testimony uh, that you know over the last over the third and fourth quarter you know that sale price is not indicative of market value because the third and fourth fourth quarter were so uh, strenuously you know there's so much growth and so uh, it's the first time I've ever seen them take that position and uh, it's a bold one it's you could say it's 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 accurate but if we're going to go there and we're going to open up market adjustments or what's known as time adjustments, market adjustments in, uh, in appraisal theory, then you better make sure you're doing it right. And you don't get to blanket the whole county at some number that came from some report. I mean, you know, what we have to do as appraisers is dig in on any assignment and, and, and make sure that it's specific to that property and identify the appraisal problem for that property. And so what should have been appropriate is, you know, they had some substantive evidence that showed for this neighborhood and over this time, and here's what it was since then. And maybe maybe I could substantiate that. But if you do that, if you open Pandora's box, then you better get ready for it this year, because I'm coming after them this year with the same argument, boys, like yeah, that market has been falling. So I don't want to hear about, you know, it, it sold in May at 500. If it sold in May this last year at 500, then I've been a lot of those pockets and a lot of those markets, at least on my side, are going to get the argument. Well, then it's less than that, according to your theory last year. So, hmm. hey, Candy, can I put my two cents on this? And then yes. we actually have a chart. We actually have a chart um, that I think we probably need to get into before too much time passes that Jim has of like the market decline that kind of Will was alluding to with um, with um, time adjustments that we're requiring. But from my experience in Colin, for years, they've never just accepted closing documents. They always say, well, do you have an appraisal that you can submit with that? Um, they don't, they have, have just not, it's not good enough for them just to have a closing disclosure. They want um, an appraisal that was done on the property as well, especially if it's a new construction property because of contract dates. Um, they could have contracted that price a year, you know, 18 months ago. And they're saying, well, what would it sell for today? You contracted that price 18 months ago, but what would it sell for today? So that's one reason why they don't take closing disclosures. Mm -hmm. And and honestly, I've, seen, I've, Colin is kind of unique in this. I mean, I'm trying to find a way to say, I do respect the job that Collin County does. I have to preface what I'm about to say with that because um, I'm walking a little tightrope here. But Collin County is much more aggressive in rejecting outside information than any other county I work in. They, they really think that what they produce internally is probably better than what anything else that they're going to receive externally. So that means I don't care what you just paid for your property. I want to see what it actually would appraise for. And that's a, that's a legitimate stance to take, but then you provide an appraisal to that and then they start beating up that appraisal. They say, well, we've got different quality ratings and things like that. I get where they're coming from, but throw at some point you got to throw the taxpayers a bone that they're doing their homework and doing their job and kind of give them the benefit of what it just sold for. But that's why I don't see them accepting closing disclosures is that um, they want an appraisal with it. And even if you have the appraisal, they're going to start beating that appraisal up because they have their own internal data like building quality adjustments, effective years, and things like that that aren't on appraisals. So it's not quite as easy as it used to be um, in Collin County and really any county that we work in. I, I think when you saw the 08 crash and you saw a lot of fraud that happened with appraisals, that kind of changed appraisal districts' mindset towards appraisals in general. And they're much more, there's a much more scrutiny applied to even appraisals that are done by third parties now. Yeah, this is true. But what chart did you guys want? To, oh, Jim, did you okay. have... Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're going to get into, um, I think you're going to see, we've got a series of graphs here, okay. and uh, I'm going to pitch this to, to Will and to Glenn and let them talk about it, and is it okay if I share a screen now, Candy? Oh, please do. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, is that case your graph showing up there, Glenn? Oh, no. Yeah, you know what? I just okay. got a note. So I got a note also from Shelby, who's kind of in the background watching us, and it's a good point. So I just want to say this before we get into that. A lot of people tuned in to also hear kind of like the basics of filing a protest and what we do. So let's keep that in mind time wise and make yeah. sure we focus on those topics. So maybe let's kind yeah. of spend a couple of minutes on this and then yeah. start answering some of the meat and bones of that topic. Yeah. Absolutely. And let me just say that uh, Glenn and Will are consultants that are absolutely at the top of their field. And so uh, you, what, what they have to say, I mean, we could be here another three hours and he'd still have more stuff to, to <laughs> shoot out. So yeah. I'm going to ask Glenn and Will to be as, just be as concise as you can. We spent a little bit more time than we thought we were going to spend on the politic, political part of this, but that's okay. That's important. So Will, set the table for us here. Yeah, what great. is this graph? This is a Case-Shiller graph. What is that saying to you? Yeah, I think, you know, overall, Case-Shiller, 
really just looks at um, over time and adjusts for inflation and things like that. It looks at uh, uh, the trend, I would say, of the U.S. housing market. And so, you, you know, pretty obvious here that over the last uh, last 10 years that uh, that's been on a steady increase. You see a, a heavy increase there in 2021. And we all know why. I think that, you know, limited supply and low interest rates and really, really, especially in, in Texas, I think we saw that where, you know, the job economy is is so thriving, uh, you know, and, and it was just a case of limited supply. You had a lot of people moving here. And uh, that drove up prices, and uh, we still see effects of that. I think most recently is is really what's peculiar. I've got let me move uh, move move you guys uh, screen over here. Yeah, so isn't that funny? I moved my I slid I slid all the faces <laughs> over, and bam, there's the uh, you know there's the peak right there, right? So so why is that? I I think um, I know my I know myself. You know when you when you talk about wanting to build your own home or things like that over these last two years, you know you get hit in the face with construction costs. Um, and you talk, you, you know, and people, I think, again, have grown sort of uh, skeptical. And, and you talk about supply chain uh, uh, issues and shortages, and, and that really uh, w did did spike that demand. So what is this here? You know, what is this in response to this peak and this this fall? And you look even closer in the DFW metro, as I stated, uh, I think in the third and fourth quarter of 2022, uh, we, seen, we, we, we saw the same thing. So a lot of skepticism in the market and sort of finishing out what I think... Uh, uh, you know, the, the great insurgents, uh, a lot of doubt in terms of national forecasts, Ukraine uh, being involved, and you, you've got um, uh, questions of, of the dollar and the, and the strength there, too. And, and now we got banks uh, in the media, too. So I think a lot of that stuff does, a, does, its, does its work to sort of inhibit uh, consumer confidence. But um, as far as local markets go in Texas, I don't, I don't see us. I'm, I'm a big believer in terms of Texas and the policies that they've put in and, and how we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stay the course here. And uh, you always see it right about that time. So uh, uh, whenever a forecast or the extrapolation of any econometric uh, goes beyond the real, then it gets real volatile. So, uh, but I'm confident. I wouldn't let that, uh, I wouldn't let that downturn scare anybody. So, well, the downturn actually plays right into our hands is what I was getting at there. Uh, this is the first downturn in this 10 years. And that's something that, uh, Glenn, I'm going to put up another one and get you to, get you to speak to this, um, if you would. Um, <clears throat> this is a graph that right. you created, I think, back in February. And um, I'll just right. let people look at this for a minute. On the horizontal axis, we have time, and it starts at 2018. On the vertical axis is the median sales price, and it's five different counties. So, uh, Glenn, what is that? What is that? What is that saying to you? What is the significance, more importantly, of this graph and that peak in the fall to property tax protests this year? Well, I would ask people to focus on like the last twenty-five percent, like the the, the, la the right side of the chart, the last twenty-five percent. The problem that you see here is like the big spike that happened in June and July. That correlates with when the most sales happen. So what we're looking at is you have to understand like mass appraisal is done. There's like a data gathering process. And the time frame that they gather sales from is typically like March, April. For, and I'll just take 2023 as an example. Um, March, April of 2022 is when they start collecting sales. And then they go all the way typically to sometime in January of 2023. And that'll make up the data, sam the data sample of properties that the appraisal district will be gathering um, for their valuation for their 2023 valuations. Well, they're collecting data during the peak of the market when all the sales are happening at the peak of the market. And so I think the notice of appraised values are gonna be lagging in the market a little bit. They're gonna indicate values that they collected during the peak of the market. And also this is a very common adjustment that's done. I mean, Jim, you're an appraiser, so you do this all the time. Um, when, when you're doing a, an appraisal report is a time adjustment. Well, a lot of appraisal districts don't do time adjustments. Basically, the concept of a time adjustment is if a property sold, and you know, if you see this red, you know, on the left side, if you see this red dot, dotted line at the, that indicates the peak of the market, if a property sold at the peak of the market, what would, have, what would it have sold for in, in January 1st of 2023? Well, it would have sold, you know, probably 10 to 15 percent less. So if the appraisal district is not making a time adjustment, that means they're inflating the indicated value that that comp shows for your property by at least 10 to 15 percent. Um, now, you know, if it's sold in, in September or October, it's not a it's not a 10 or 15 percent drop. It's probably more like an 8 percent drop. But still, the, the, the point stands that all the sales are probably going to indicate a higher a higher value than it should than what the property would actually have sold for in January. And so that's going to be a big battle that we're fighting this year. 
the, the, the challenge that we have, I mean, this is just what's in our playbook. So if you're, if you're a property owner and you want to protest the value yourself and the, and the um, appraisal district throws out a comp that sold in, in June of 2023, my first rebuttal to that would be, you know, maybe screenshot this graph that we're showing in this webinar and just say values have dropped since then. And so you need to, you need to adjust that sales price down, you know, 10 right. or 15, 10 or 15%. And then let's talk about what my value would indicate. But if you're not making that adjustment, then the value is too high. Yeah. You know what? We'll so, publish this on Candy Sturt in case you guys didn't get to take a shot of that. Is that okay, guys? Yeah, sure. 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 Perfect. Thank you. So that's great, Glenn. I'm just going to go back and summarize real quick. Here's the case shiller. You show, you show the drop right at the end right there. That's the most widely watched index in the, in the real estate markets. Right. You see here, all counties are showing the same pattern, big drop right there. Here it is with a little different, little different uh, perspective on it. So, Will, Will, this is your graph, and yeah. I think this is a very interesting graph. I'm not 100 percent sure I'm interpreting it right, so I, I want you to talk about that. What is oh, that graph you know, saying to it, us? You, you know, that's the best thing about a, a, a property tax consultant, right? Is is to throw all the information out there, and you know, I'm I'm pretty upset. So, uh, you know, there's got to be something wrong here. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you what my 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 interpretation is, and I'll just comment. Look, look, look and I. Again, for the listeners out there, to echo what they've said, and I, I hope what we what what you caught there was the why, right? The interest rates were up, and the market got a little scared and intimidated. Buyers buyers slowed down, and when it slows down, you know, should I be scared too? So that's what we saw. And then, of course, it goes back to fours and fives, and it wasn't that very long ago when everybody was investing at four and five as well. So it's kind of softened. But again, look at the regional forces, look at the national forces. America's strong. Texas is strong. We'll be fine. And I, 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 didn't, I don't want people to freak out about, you know, that case shell are turning down right there. But what do we have here is, is uh, well, look, be advised that th these bullets here on this Dallas County uh, graph, these blue dots, that's the median sale price per year. And this is what I mean about the interpretation, right? So from 22 to 23, it's very easy for an appraisal district or especially a rookie or somebody to say, man, appraisals, appraisals are up. Appraisals are up, 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 right? But that's just the, the median. And that's not, that doesn't, when you, when you tear it down, you look at this year's, it's actually come back down to a January. So, and I think we just saw that, you know, when you look at third and fourth quarter of, of 2022. So we'll want to emphasize in your protests, you want to, you want to hammer like, Hey, don't forget, you know, that the interest rates spiked and value started coming down. So y'all got to give me credit for that, you know, from, from sales or whatever in the, in the middle of the year. So what I think is most interesting though, about this y'all is, is, and I didn't highlight it, but see that cap percent. See down there on the bottom below appraise where it says cap PCT. And in 2020, it was four and a half. And then in 2021, it was 4.1. And this is what Glenn was saying is, isn't that fascinating that in one year, it went to 10.7 and the 10.5. And what does that tell me? That on average, everyone is limited. Everyone is limited yeah. to the 10%, yeah. which is fascinating. That means that market values have, have gone way above and now all the homesteads have kicked in. And so what do we have is a bigger gap in between that red line and that green line over the last two years. And that's fascinating to me. It's not a big deal to me that the market value opinion is different than the blue line. I mean, they always come in underneath. We all know yeah. that they're trying to be limit protests and they always come in low and they're trying to catch up you see, they did a pretty good job of catching up last year when everybody went crazy, right? That's a pretty steep increase on market value opinion. And then they did a pretty darn good job this year too, because they're still playing catch up. But even though they're catching up, again, I'd reemphasize that, hey, over the last third and fourth quarter, which is most important uh, to in 2022, that the January 1, 2023 values are a product of a falling real estate market. And um, so- in so those are annual, those are annual medians, right? Annual medians, yes, sir. Right up okay. above there. Yeah. You so got I agree. It. And I think what Will's saying is that this graph shows one thing, annual median, but really You're right. this is what is to be, this is the focus. That's where your comps are going to come from. Yeah, that's it. So that's great. Uh that's a great chart, Will. Hey, hey guys, I'm seeing what... I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of questions about kind of dialing it back and simplifying it. Um, <laughs> like what let maybe, maybe, maybe we take the the Maybe let's just talk about if, you know, let's pretend that we're just homeowners and with our with our knowledge and what we would do to protest our value, because this graph just that graph that you were showing just basically shows what we were already saying, which is most of the sales happen at the peak of the market. So if you're wondering, is my value high this year? I'm I think probably just based on that information as a blanket statement, it's definitely worth pursuing 
uh, mm -hmm. a reduction on. But so if, if I'm a homeowner and I'm just protesting my value, here's what I'm going to do. Okay. And I'm, you can hire a firm like mine and wills. And we, that's the, that's the easy button. Boom. Easy button firm handles it for you. It's automated. Here's what that, here's what that experience is like. You sign, you sign an authorization document. As soon as you sign the authorization document, we file the protest for you. You know, Will's company does this too. And Will can probably put his own spin on what we're, what they do, but I'm sure it's going to be exactly with what I'm doing. It's not unique to my company. Um, we file the protest for you. Then we submit, then we get into a negotiation phase with the appraisal district where we're, we're discussing information like comps and things like that, you know, recent sales in your area, and we're making adjustments to it, you know, hey, this property, um, this property sold next door to my, to my client's property, and it's larger, so I'm going to make an adjustment for that, it has a pool, so I'm going to make an adjustment for that, in other words, the adjustment means my property would sell for more or less than this property based on, on those factors. So if it's larger, obviously that property is going to sell for more than your property because it's smaller. People are going to pay more for a, for a larger property. So you need to reflect that. So that's why you can't just take price per square foot. Um, I know I'll, I'll let Will probably take that part of the conversation because you're very, I mean, we're both passionate about that, probably equally so. Yeah. So um, yeah, price per square foot is a bad strategy. And you're, you know, if we do that, since we're professionals, we get laughed out of the building. They're a little bit more forgiving of homeowners because they understand you don't have the expertise that we do. Um, but Will, what's the problems with price per square foot? You know, because uh, we see that yeah. a lot, especially realtors. But it's it's not a good strategy. Yeah, well, I'll st I'll start there. And in Dallas, you you know, you might you might be handcuffed to it because in Dallas, their analysis in the defense hearing does boil down to, as you know, price per foot it becomes a price per right. foot game. And all they got to do is put up uh, two smaller comps, and you lose because you know they're not making adjustments for economies of scale. So you got to watch out for that. But you you can, as realtors, you know, they like to talk about PSF two, and and that's good to do. But you got to make sure you make adjustments. And most realtors know that. But when you hand over a CMA to your clients. You got to tell them, hey, be cautious of that PSF, and you got to same same with what Glenn's saying in your hearings. You got to. Okay, wait, let's out. define CMA is a. Yeah, uh, let, let me ask analysis. you a question. Can I, can I, let me ask you a question. A CMA is a comparative market analysis. It's what well, I know. We have a lot of real estate agents online here with us, and CMAs um, can be great. But uh, Glenn, I've heard you say something about a CMA, so I'm come to you first. Yeah, and then a, we'll, a, CMA, CMA, a CMA is just a tool that the realtor uses as a, as a conversation piece with their client. The realtor is actually doing a verbal analysis with their client. You know, I don't think I don't think realtors really list their properties based on what the CMA does. Mm -hmm. It's just a way for them to kind of get more raw data and then they kind of massage it with their conversations that they have with their clients. So it's not a knock on realtors valuation. It's but it's not a good a CMA alone is has a lot of issues with it without a realtor being there to explain why this property would sell for more or less than your property. So, I mean, and PSF is price per square foot. Will was just using the abbreviation for price right. per square foot. I'm, I'm, I'm a government guy. Acronyms are everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so that that CMA really the realtor is actually the bridge between the data, which is all the CMA is and the analysis. So. And Real, I see people doing I, I see people doing price that. per I still I see people doing price per square foot not only just for recent sales from a, a, a CMA but also like my neighbor's house is is price per square foot you know lower than mine and again they're doing adjustments on those also so I'm 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 sorry well go ahead and take over what you were That's saying. Okay. That's okay. No, I, I just, I hope to explain that to people. Just be cautious with them and make sure you make adjustments um, for not only pools, but size as well. And I'm, I'm aggressive. I'm, if I'm, I'm outside of the 3% size range and I start making size adjustments, but, but that's uh, not everybody has to do. I, look, I'd give you my tips for those that are watching. And when, and when people ask me like, Hey, you, you know, can you help me out or how, I want to do it myself. And, and, and here's what I tell them um, is that, well, number one, don't mess around with the deadlines understand when your deadline is and get because they won't they won't compromise on that so uh number two you're probably going to be hit with an offer be skeptical okay it's a, it's an automated offer and if it shows a reduction then they just throw it out there to you and you think it's great because you're getting a reduction uh, there maybe there's more on the table and you you know and, and i wouldn't end there because it was easy so be skeptical of those offers because they're they're usually not very good um, but, but at, we'll let me just yeah. dig in there a little bit sure. um you know and I'm bad about this as an appraiser. You know, we get married. We think our data is so good. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't put your feet in concrete on your opinion, should you? Absolutely not. No, I mean. Yeah. Uh, so you're not, you're usually not going to get your number most of the that's time. That's true. No, no. Yeah. 
that, that there again, that may be what makes uh, Glenn and I so good, right? Is we uh, we do our we we sp stay up late nights and and then we, uh, we we come to what we think is true and then we go fight for it. We get to go. Well, fight what Will and it. I what but, Will and I have done is effectively reverse engineer the appraisal district's systems. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we've invested lots of time and money into our software. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, Will's company is excellent at this, also. You know, and, and my company is very good at it, also. So we have a more sophisticated understanding, and that's the benefit of hiring a firm. I mean, a firm like ours, I should say. There's there's firms that use price per square foot out there. They don't yeah. do any better evidence than than what you could do yourself. So yeah. that's a question: is what does your evidence look like yeah. uh, if you're going to hire a firm? What does your evidence look like? Um, steer clear of flat fee companies, um, yeah. especially in a year like this when you know you've got your market value way up here and your cap is down here and you get your market value down there and you paid somebody $250 but you saved no money so yeah. uh don't don't go with a flat fee company i'm not saying go with you don't have to go with my company we charge a a percentage of the savings i i think and, and so does will's company they charge a percentage of the savings yeah that that fee structure makes sense for you and it makes sense and it, but in years like this you know we work a lot of cases for free um, that's the cost of our business, but don't make, don't make our problem, your problem by paying a flat fee to somebody basically. Um, yeah. so if you're going to hire a firm, that's just one tidbit to, to steer clear of. Um, Hey, Will, besides, besides, uh, sales information, if you're doing it yourself, what would you, what would you be doing? Um, sure. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, there's two, two points that you led me into there, Glenn. And one of them, I was going to say that next one ties into what you and Glenn were talking about, do your homework. So uh, get your sales from your realtor, uh, but but don't stop there. Look at other houses and see what they're being taxed at. Okay, because that's a big piece of the party too, and and um, and I think that's a valid argument, you know. And th they'll figure out the rest if you bring them the goods. Hey, this house just like mine, and so is this one, so is this one, so is this one. They're all being taxed at this, uh, you know. At, they'll 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 know whether or not that's a valid argument. So do your research and bring that information in and then bring the sales in that you think are, you know, would help your case there too. So, but more importantly, I was going to say too, is get the evidence from the district. So before you have your hearing, right, get a copy of it. So you know what you're going up against and you can look at that and understand what you're up against there before you, before you get in there. So beyond that, you really, the one key word here is atypical guys. So uh, mass appraisal system is about distribution and and it, it's a lot of assumptions about keeping up with the Joneses. And these days, I'm sorry to tell you, most of the districts I see take that theory and they they inject it to everybody. And what does it mean? We're going to take all these sales and we're going to assume that everybody's keeping up with the Joneses. So everybody's at the sales. And now the burden of proof has shifted to you. And that means you have to come and disprove that you are updated and painted and have new HVAC and you have new roof and you have to come in and show that now because they're assuming otherwise in a lot of cases. So I think I think when you come in prepared with that information, that's a big help as well. Here's a set of so, photos that, here, go ahead, Jim. Uh, I was just going to ask you, you guys to comment on something that we touched on, but I think it's really important. Um, how would you like to see as a taxpayer, how would you like to see the district's playbook? How would you like to see their evidence packet before you even go in? So there's a way you can do that. Uh, so I don't know either one of you, Glenn, if you want to take this and then we'll come in next. Yeah. How do you, right. how do you find out what the district is going to use? There's a method for that. Yeah. There's a provision in the tax code. It basically, <clears throat> um, is, is referred to as the 14 day evidence request, which is you file, you, first of all, you have to file a protest. That's step one, file your protest. I would use the online protest, like an e-file option. It's super easy to do and just get it done. And again, just real cover real quick on the deadlines. Um, Dallas is going to have an extended deadline this year of May 21st. Collin County is going to be May 15th. I believe Denton County is May 17th this year. And Tarrant County was originally scheduled for a May 15th deadline. But uh, Will, you notified us of this, that they had to extend that deadline to May 30th because of all the website issues that they've had. Um, but in general, the rule is May 15th is the deadline, but it, it's kind of all over the place again this year, uh, mainly in, in Dallas and in Tarrant. Dallas is behind because of the hack that they had last fall that Candy, your, your publication covered that. Um, but um, yeah, so file the protest before the deadline, which is why I kind of got off on that, that tie right on the deadlines. Step one, file protest. Step two, you, um, you have to request the appraisal district's evidence at least 14 days prior to your scheduled appraisal review board hearing. And what that does is that, that locks them in to whatever they provide to you they cannot alter that that evidence in the hearing. So even if after the fact you have submitted evidence after they've already given you their 14-day evidence request, 
um, they cannot take anything that you give them at that point and change their data. So they're locked into what they've given you. They can't introduce new evidence in the hearing. What that does is it avoid, when you're able to review their evidence before the hearing, you can practice your rebuttal. Um, Will and I are, are, you know, have done thousands of protests at the appraisal review board. And so we can do rebuttals very effectively on the spot with no practice. Um, but that's because we have tons of reps at it. If you're a homeowner, you're doing this once a year, maybe. So yeah. get their evidence ahead of time, review it. You're going to probably have, what is going on with, I have a lot of questions. Take that opportunity to call the appraisal district. What does this mean? What does this mean? Don't ask those questions in the hearing because when you show up in the hearing and you know what you're talking about and you have an effective rebuttal, that's going to separate you so much from anybody else that goes in there without a plan. So requesting the evidence is a huge part of the process for homeowners, especially because a lot of people get kind of get shocked when they go in the hearing. The appraisal districts have these million dollar technology systems and click, click, click. And all of a sudden, the argument that you presented is blown up because of evidence that they produced. By requesting the evidence ahead of time, it avoids that that surprise, and you know exactly what to expect going into the hearing, and it builds confidence. The more confidence you can project in a hearing to the appraisal review board, and you're not fumbling around and knowing what to do, the better. The let shorter repeat, you. Let me repeat that for everyone. Get your. You can ask for the evidence from Dallas County, 14 days in advance. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's that's any county. And Will is showing up. Hey, Will, talk because they're not going to see yeah. you. So Oh, go oh ahead, yeah, sure. I got to talk in order to see that's true. This is the section of the tax code that allows you that Glenn was, Glenn was referencing, if that helps. 41, 461. Uh, yeah. Gives you 14 days to, uh, to get hey, to Will, what's your, what's, your, what's your take on just what I just said? You know, what would you, what would you change? What would yeah, you, look, you I, no, I, I think uh, I think you're all spot on. I think um, the only other thing I guess I thought I would add, I did write down a note, was, um, was that the, uh, hey, bring in the... Um, Bring, they're, they're aware of the last year's value, but they're not offering that. I know the board is, and sometimes they'll ask for it, but hey, tell them and remind them, you know, if it was relatively close to what you think is true, and then bring in a newspaper. <laughs> Show them, go fuck. When I say do your homework, bring in a newspaper that tells everybody that the interest rates are up, that the housing market was crashing, like put it back on them, like this is nonsense. You don't know about the assumptions that they're making. You don't understand them because they're too complex, and that's the way it is. You could just show Candy's dirt on your phone. Yeah, or that, yeah, you go right there. That's right. Yeah. Say, look, yeah, that's right. You know who this is. She was saying the same thing. So, uh, yeah. so I think that's bring, important. Bring the graph in. Yeah, yeah. Bring, bring the Will. graph in. So, yeah. Will, let me ask you, I'm, when we're talking about the hearings, let's stick to one thing here. Um, there are some do's and don'ts in a hearing. And there are some, a couple of things you can do in a hearing that are guaranteed to get you a big eyeball roll, which means they, they're totally tuned you out. And there's a five letter word that I think Will has, has taught me this a few years ago that you should never, ever use in the IRB hearing. That's what right. is that word? It, it is taxes. Yeah, don't talk about your taxes. But don't I thought that's what we're doing. Yeah, nobody cares. Are we protesting taxes. our taxes? You said it. You said it. You, one one word, Take wipe out that taxes word and replace it with value. That's okay. what we're talking about is value. You bet. Okay. <laughs> Good so point. what about, what are some things that uh, I know you, Glenn sees these in the chat line and will you do too. Uh, the homeowners want always want to come in and tell you everything, tell the board everything wrong with their house. What are the things that just does not flat move the needle at all and pretty much guaranteed to get an eyeball roll? I see kind of like just kind of basic landscape deferral is not really going to be much very effective. You, you kind of need to really make it stick to kind of bigger ticket items that really impact the value. So like like, a, like, here's what works, okay? If you have like a foundation issue, and, and it, first of all, when, we get, when we're talking about condition, it has to have impacted the value of the property on January 1st of the tax year. So in this case, it, if somebody were to come in and buy your house on January 1st of 2023, that would have to be an issue that would show up at like in an inspection report. Or if a buyer is walking through your property and they're like, gosh, this kitchen is really not dated relative to everything else. That would be an issue that would impact, you know, that's really not a repair issue. That's more of just like a cosmetic issue. Um, but, uh, you know, so as far as like repair issues go, it's like foundation. You have to have like a third party estimate with that. So like mold, things like that. Those are issues that really move the needle. What doesn't move the needle is like kind of the, the bad fence in the back, um, the fence that kind of is, is little issues, even though it's kind of like it does that does impact the real world. It's just it, it's kind of normal. A lot, of, you know. Uh, it's what's considered normal wear and tear for a property doesn't move the needle. It's got to be something that's outside of what would be considered normal wear and tear 
for a property. If you want to kind of nice. contrast, if you want to kind of show that your house is not updated, there's a few photos that I recommend showing, and that's kitchen, um, a front front view of your house um, from the street. So kind of go to your neighbor's house across the street, take a picture of your house, take a picture of your kitchen, take a picture of your master bath, take a picture of your living room, and it kind of shows like the flooring and things like that. And those can be packaged up to kind of give the appraisal district a general sense of the condition, interior condition of your property. And they could they could lower your value based on that information. And so if you that's kind of the easy route. One of the easy routes to go for a reduction is to kind of take those kinds of photos and see what they say. Sometimes you get pushback and say, well, this is kind of normal for the area, so we're not going to go with that. Or we have recent sales that show higher than that. So I'm not saying ignore the recent sales. In fact, Will and I, that's where we get most of our movement is in recent sales. Totally. Um, so, but, but if you're, again, if you're going to do it, recent sales can be a tricky argument to make, you know, you can, I mean, you, you can, you can, I'm not saying you can't make it, but I mean, if you're going to get to the level, like Will and I are talking about adjustments and we're disagreeing with the appraisal district's adjustments, I mean, you got to be pretty skilled at doing something like that. So if you want to kind of keep it simple, you might go the condition route that might not give you the most bang for your buck, but it could be effective and easy to do. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, yeah. One, one quick axiom there to summarize, okay. I think is, is, uh, is important is like, think about when you go in to sell your home and what you'd have to disclose, right. Or what, what repairs, you know, what the repairs at them would, would, would you typically command. Right. So these are things yep. that are outside of what is considered normal maintenance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when we're going to the ARB, we've got these typically three people on a panel. And so a couple of questions for each one of you on this. First of all, Will, we're, where do those three people on the panel come from? What are the qualifications yeah. for the board? And are they really neutral the way they say they are? Who they work for, who pays them, et cetera? <laughs> well, we all have our opinions of how this system should work and how it is currently working. And so I think uh, to be without bias is probably a, a, maybe something we could all aspire to in, in all of our dealings personally and professionally. But uh, but so that's as soft as I can answer is I wish I wish that they were purely independent, but I don't think they are. However, they are educated. I mean, you know, these are these yeah. are people that are appointed and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're business professionals and they're in a lot of sometimes a lot of retirees and former CEOs, uh, uh, pilots, uh, um, you know, so. But there's no uh, there's no academic qualifications. Are there? Chiefs. No, I, I don't believe there is. No, sir. And um, but but from what I find is that most of them are very well educated and, and um you know, and kind people, you know, they're trying to okay. do the right thing too. But again, these, these matters can get complex sometimes. And if they, if they do fall on one side, you know, the, uh, I'd hope that they fall on the taxpayer side. So, okay. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask both of you something. This is something kind of new that they've instigated a couple of years ago. You can opt for a single member ARB. Hmm. So uh, Glenn, I think I've heard you address this, but I don't think, have you ever had a single member ARB? I have, you just have, I have one person like a judge. I have done it. I don't necessarily, I wouldn't recommend that to a, a property owner. Um, okay. If you're a property owner and you're going to do your, your protest and you plan on going to the appraisal review board hearing, I would not opt for the single panel member. It's one of those things that I kind of feel out with the appraisal district. Um, you got to keep in mind with, with, Agent, and this might be a point of this. I know this will actually probably be a dis point of disagreement with Will, which is great. That's why we wanted Will on here to offer his perspective also. Um, <laughs> my experience with single panel members is I feel it out with the appraisal district that I'm working with. And sometimes there's something to be said about making it easier to work with you. And if you're an agent and you're controlling thousands of protests like we do, and we're getting it through the system really quickly and efficiently, I think that I think that affords us better results in the long run. I think the ARBs prefer that because they're moving faster. The appraisal district prefers that because they're moving faster. So for me, it's about speed. And I, I don't think I, I'm not sacrificing results in that from what I've been measuring. And in fact, I actually think I get better results in, in a single panel member because what I've seen happen in the appraisal review board hearings a lot of time is there's group think. There's three of them there and they kind of get coverage with, I don't really want to lower the value or I don't really you know want to lower the value and this person doesn't want to lower the value. So they, in a group, they feel safe not lowering the value. Whereas if it's a single panel member, they've got to be the, they're the one and only decision maker. And I think they, that, that, that dynamic is removed. And I've, and I've no, actually nobody seen, behind, behind. Well, and it's anecdotal, but last year I had the same chairman in a three panel member one day and, you know, movement sometimes not moving other times. And it was in Dallas. So basically the, the appraisal district is, is agreeing to lower the value based on my evidence in the ARB hearing and the, and the ARB is just kind of agreeing with the appraisal district's new lower value. So we're getting lower value, but they're not disagreeing necessarily with the appraisal district. 
I had that same chairman in a um, in a hearing the next day in a single panel member, and he's disagreeing with the with the appraisal district. So that's anecdotal from my perspective. I know Will has good reason for disagreeing with that. So Will, why don't you why don't you take it? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's good. I mean, that sounds that sounds really great. I um I think it, you know it's kind of that 50 50 thing. You know, you may land on a good one or you may land on a bad one. I think I think for me, you know, our sure. our, our taxes sort of pay for this structure, and it's not on the counties to decide. You know, what's right for them is best for all. You know, that's a state right that's been uh, allowed to us, and a triumvirate. For me, a triumvirate sort of uh, mitigates that bias, right? Because then you get, then you, then you get, if they're doing their job and they're deliberating, you know, on the record and speaking their mind on the record, then hopefully it's commonsensical and, you know, and there is some level of of reasonableness, you know, to their to their decision. So you'd hope for that, but uh, um, I think. Um, you know, panels every day in our hearings uh, uh, are, are, are open and independent. I, I suppose I've always been more comfortable with the triumvirate just because uh, I know the quality of evidence that I'm presenting and and I'd hate for one person to, to to not consider that dutifully, you know, and so maybe I think it's uh, it, it's that I'm, I'm sure that, you know, they're going to catch on, um, you know, make sure that this doesn't get kind of glazed over, you know, if there's more in the room. I don't, I don't know. I could see benefits to both, pros and cons to both. Okay. But uh, yeah. So we're down hey, to about I, six I, minutes. So yeah, I wanted just to get Sandy. Go ahead. You were saying exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, Go I ahead. was going to say we're down to five minutes, so I want to get it just as concise as we can. But I got one more question on ARB, then we'll move off of that. Telephone hearing or in person? Will? Yeah, telephones. Telephones no good. I mean, y'all, please. You just, you know, I, I, again, I can only speak for me. And as as a, as a former appraiser, I'd go into those hearings, and the people would be on the phone, and there would be, you know, some evidence coming up on the screen, and it'd be all convoluted and all over the place, and there was no rhythm to it. There was no, uh, there was no, you know, climax, if you will, to the story. It was just discombobulated, and then. There's no person looking at there, looking at you in the eye. So when I was the appraiser and I had a board and a taxpayer, I'm sorry, when I was on that side <laughs> and a taxpayer was come on the room. I mean, frankly, it's about, you know, I'm doing the best I can do and you're doing the best. And if and if if I disagreed, then he was probably going to lose because because I'm the one in the room, you know, showing and, and controlling sort of the flow of the argument as well. I just think you're at a serious disadvantage with a, with a phone uh, hearing. Absolutely. Here's what I would say. Here's what I would say about that. Um, if you're a property owner and you're representing yourself and you want to go to the ARB hearing, like half the people don't show up to the ARB hearing. And I think that's because you got to drive down there, wait in the lobby. And it's like a three hour ordeal yeah. out of your out of your day. So if you are dead set on on protesting yourself, I think it's better to call in than just to not show up. It's more convenient. Yeah. So I would, I would, I would, yeah, from Will's perspective as an agent, I totally get what he's saying. Yeah. If you're going to do it yourself and you, and you, and you don't think you're going to show, I, I would say the worst thing you can do is not show up for the hearing. The best thing you can do is probably show up for the hearing, like what Will's saying, but as a compromise, call in, you know, uh, yeah. do it from there. Don't, don't just not show up to the hearing. So it's, 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 it's there as a convenience, um, you know, so just keep that in perspective. I, half the people don't show up to the hearing. Maybe maybe some of those people can use a phone hearing and actually show up to the hearing that way. Good. Can I offer so, something? Andy, There's a lot yeah. of questions there. And um, what if we try to answer those questions and post them on Candy Stirt? Would that be helpful? I I yeah, so I see 91 questions. I know. <laughs> well, we can have, like, there's, there's one that's going to be repetitive, I'm sure. Um, but I think we can be do repetitive. That. Like, what let if me, there's nothing see. wrong with my house or something? You know, yes. let me let me see if Will is okay with this. I know Candy's, you're, you know, you're running for office right now and you got to go really beat the, the yeah, you got to go beat the streets right now, uh, <laughs> walk in your neighborhood. So, you, if you're okay, I know that you got to, and you're, you're probably going to be talking to your constituents about a lot of what we've been talking about in this yeah. webinar. Yeah. So if you if you need to check out in a couple of minutes to go do that, um, I'm I'm willing to stay and answer some questions if and, okay. and will. I know of it's course. a busy time for us, Will. So if you want to stick around, we can answer some questions. Yeah, yeah. happy to help. Okay. Again, if, if that's something that you feel like there's some really general questions that we can group together, we're happy to to do that with you guys. And yeah, this is something I mean, this is exactly what my opponent is crowing about is, oh, the biggest, you know, tax cut in 40 years and like everyone's dying because their values have gone up. So it's very disingenuous of politicians to say that. And if I do this when I'm on council, you guys can come beat me. OK, <laughs> okay. that's right. We'll um, hold you to it. That's right. <laughs> so I, I we'll stay some... on a while here. Uh... Let me just pitch out a couple of questions and you, Will, you and Glenn can, can jump on these, whoever wants to. We had a question about the allocation between the land and the improvements. And this comes up all the time. Yeah. Can you just protest the land or just protest the improvements? And how can your improvements 
go up in value when you haven't done anything to your house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll answer both and I'll go quickly uh, because it's an, they're answering the call to the market and, and we know we're in a hot market right now. So, so even though you haven't done anything, the market's changing, market's increasing. With regards to splitting out the land, look, you can only talk, you can only argue total value. But part of that, as you know, when you make adjustments is adjusting for differences and the land is certainly a component of that. So if they try to beat you down and say, we're not talking about them, talking about the land, you tell them, you tell them, Will said, well, a land makes up the value and you got to adjust for land value differences. <laughs> That's a big thing. Okay. I was seeing a lot of questions kind of specific to Dallas on condition ratings. Um, that kind of speaks to a bigger thing is like, yeah, a lot of the advice that we give could, it could be siloed in, and on a per county basis, because they all do it so differently. Yeah. Um, so Dallas does, they measure their, the condition of a property through what's called like a desirability rating, or they used to call it a CDU rating. Um, they've, I think they've shifted their terminology in the recent years to desirability rating. CDU stood for condition, desirability, utility. And, you know, you're probably familiar with it. If you live in Dallas, it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a gradient of like excellent all the way down to like un, uninhabitable. And the further you move, are able to move down, so like excellent, very good, good, average, fair, poor, very poor, and then uninhabitable, the further you're able to move down that gradient, it's going to get you, uh, you know, five or 10% off of the improvement of the value of your property. The way that you do that is, um, it's kind of funny. It actually goes into one of the questions that somebody emailed me, which was, um, there's, a, there's sales in my neighborhood that sold for really high, but they're still qualified as average in the condition rating. Well, I think that's because Dallas got hacked last year and in the fall, and they're behind in collecting data. And it, it, it happened in my neighborhood. There's there's properties that sold, you know, that sold for in the 600s, and they're on the tax rolls uh, and on DCAD's valuation for like four 450000 So they're way off on the sale price. And they still have that same property that was totally flipped and everything as an average rating. Well, I'm an average rating also. And I haven't, you know, I haven't, I haven't recently flipped my property like that. Yeah. And so what I would do is I would take pictures of properties that sold. Maybe you can go on Zillow or something like that, capture the picture, and then compare that to your house and just say, why is this property an average and why am I an average? And I want to be at least one, you know, I want to move from average to fair because it's not, it's not fair that this property is valued as an average and I'm an average when there's a clear difference between, you know, this property just has a newly renovated kitchen and mine's 10 years old, you know, that kind of thing. That's so, it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so side by side comparisons of photos of sales. Okay. You got to go, Candy. Bye, Candy. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Bye, Candy. Thanks Candy. for hosting this. Bye. So, Thanks, thanks, Candy. We have, a, we have a question Good about, uh, can protesting ever backfire on you? Can they ever raise your value? Mm -hmm. No, a lot really? of people think that. They, it's a hard enough job, and I admit it, you know, on the appraisal districts to do what they do, you know, and try to get it right. They're not, they are not nefarious, you know, they're not, um, I don't believe intentionally, they are, you know, they're not, they certainly don't hold grudges, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, well, legally, uh, they can't, though, can they? Am I right no, on that? No, of course not. I mean, legally, they have appraisal standards, just like any other appraiser is supposed to, you know, they have to follow the ethics rule, and of course, and so we we trust that. And um, But correct you know, me but, if I'm wrong, because yeah. I, I thought in the tax code a couple of years ago, they passed something saying that you the appraisal district or the uh, chief appraiser cannot raise your value just because that you was, protested. That was a part of Senate Bill 2 that passed in 2020. Before, it was kind of like this informal agreement that that an appraisal district wouldn't do that. But then you saw Tarrant County one year, and it wasn't the appraisal district that was doing it. It was actually the appraisal review board <laughs> was, okay. was increasing values in a hearing. And what Senate Bill 2 said was that that's no longer legal. So there is absolutely no risk at all filing a protest and getting your value increased anymore. Yeah. There's a law that protects against that. Okay. You, you wonder if that board member was a little biased. Yeah. Oh, I, that's ridiculous, so, right, Will? I mean, to go in and uh, taxpayers protesting their value and be like, oh, actually, we're going to increase your value. I mean, yeah, that speaks to, yeah, you're right. That speaks to the sometimes the nature that an ARB member can have. I mean, that's that's pretty ridiculous. So luckily, luckily, there's a law right now that, that you, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> so we had uh, a couple of questions about a topic we haven't covered. Uh, equal and uniform. Um, I know that what taxpayers do, but I know it doesn't work. Would one of you want to take that and and get into that? Yeah. Of worms. Well, stay away from the word taxes. Again, stay away from the word taxes. Okay. Number one. All right. That's a universal rule. But what are we trying to do? The concept is ad valorem. It's it's according to value. We we all trust that if I have a three hundred thousand dollar home. 
uh, I should pay about a third of what the guy who has a million dollar home is paying. And that's fair. And that's fine. That's a good ever since the Romans. That makes sense. You know, and that's we, we can believe in that. Uh, but when we find that instead that uh, these are all cookie cutter homes. Right. But but here I'm going to use it for this example. <laughs> but his taxes are so much less. Well, that's because his appraised value is so much less. And, and you really got to get down to that. So it's as simple as this. If you want to try an equal uniform argument, you, you can use the same approach as you do if it's sales or something like this. And and uh, but you need to consider those appraised values as the market value or as the appraised value indication rather than the sale price. Uh, so it's that that's generally the best way to help people understand how to how to make that argument. OK. Um... While I'm looking at the next question, Glenn, what do you think the two takeaway, two main takeaways from today's session are that you'd like for people to, to go home with today? Someone type that okay. we covered. Yeah. Um, Will, are you there? I think Glenn yeah, froze up. Yep, I froze for a second, but I'm back. I, think, I feel like okay. I'm alive again. Go ahead and take that. I think Glenn's still frozen up. Okay. Um, yeah, the main takeaways, the main takeaways from, from today's session. Yeah, main takeaways for me is, um, you know, again, it, I'll stick to my my, my script here is um, uh, don't miss the deadline. Watch out for those uh, offers. Uh, do your homework. Ask for evidence. Get you some sales. Make sure that you're making a good argument on sales. Check out other appraisals uh, as well. Look at the adjustments and be cautious of the appraisal district's adjustments. Okay, but but stick to three keys. Don't go off uh, running on on tangents. Case okay? come into the come into the hearing prepared with what your argument is, you know, and what it's, what it's faceted on. Try to blow up their argument whenever they come at you, but mainly stick to your points. And, and I think we gave you those. Use some sales, use some ENU, bring some cost estimates, stuff that you'd have to disclose if you were to sell the property, and then remind them what the market's been doing, either through media or some kind of news source like that. I, okay. I've seen a few people. Yeah, I think you're frozen up. Go yeah, ahead, I was frozen up. I was seeing a few people that were asking questions about how do you select comps. I generally look for properties that, you know, when they say, what do you mean by recent sale? Well, I mean, the, the date of valuation for property taxes for this year is going to be January 1st of 2023. So the closer that property sold to January 1st of 2023, the better. But you can go all the way back until April. But again, I would avoid doing that because that was the peak of the market. I would try to choose properties as, as close as January 1st as possible. Try to find properties that are, you know, ideally within 10% the size of your property. Um, stay within your neighborhood if you can. Um, don't don't go one mile away. What what can hurt people is if they just try to get the value so low and they and they negate their credibility to do that, then then you're not going to have people willing to work with you. If, if if they know that you're going to you know way across town to pull comps and you're going properties that are way smaller than your property to pull comps or properties that are built by a different builder, maybe not as nice a builder as you. Um, it's, you know, especially if you're in Collin County and you're in some in some phased development, there's there's degrees of quality in those developments. Um, you know, ideally you're choosing comps that are the same quality as you, same size, you know, roughly same size, and it's sold, um, you know, as close to January 1st as possible. Again, you can go back to April if you need to, but if you're going to go back to April or later earlier on in 2022, make sure and adjust that sales price down, you know, 10 or 15 percent to account for the drop in the market since then. Um, so that's how I'm, that's how we're going to be selecting comps. Um, and for equal and uniform, it's the same thing. Instead of just looking for recent sales and instead of starting at a sale price, you're just looking at your neighbor's house and just, you know, saying, well, they're a little bit larger than me, or they've got a pool and I don't have a pool. So make those same adjustments that you would make with recent sales. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how we select comps. Okay. Good tips. Uh, somebody's like, how, how many comps, um, uh, yeah, three Great. comps. Great. Three comps is good. Um, in some counties, we go four to six comps. In Dallas, I know they stick to three comps. Will, what do you think? I think it's a good answer. I, I think for market, if you're looking at the market value uh, portion of the protest, that's that's adequate. If you're looking at the equal and uniform, you know, uh, oftentimes a lot of calls that I get uh, uh, here, at, you know, and I'm sure it goes the same for your for you guys too. But uh, is uh, you know my neighbor and. And uh, this right. one guy, and it's like, well, right. there's got to be more than one. You right. know, got to be getting a bad deal, you know, by at least four. So sometimes when you make that uh, uniform argument, you know, you need at least nine comps. And that's really where, you know, hiring right. hiring myself or hiring a firm really comes into play because 
uh, we already have the data and the research and we know what is going to be considered uh, credible. Um, so that's really the challenge of the taxpayer who takes this on themselves or the mechanic that's trying to do this themselves is you got to dive in and get all that data, uh, you know, land size, the, the age, the size of the home and, you know, whether or not it has a pool or not an outdoor kitchen. And you got to have all that ready and prepared so you can make a credible argument. And uh, anyway, I'd say on, on market, you're good with a minimum of three. But if you try to make an a unequal appraisal argument, you better get in the seven, eight and nine, you know, or higher. Yeah. Oh, somebody asked, how do they get MLS information? Like, do they get it from real estate agents? No, it's not like from, it, it's from the, it's from the MLS system itself. And there's a bit of a, there was a bit of an argument on that in Tarrant County. Um, I know that the Travis board of realtors said that the, uh, that the Travis appraisal district couldn't have access to the MLS system anymore. And that created a lot of issues for them. But it, it, you know, it's not like your realtor is feeding data to the appraisal district. Um, it's 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 done through the actual systems level, the, the software level that controls the MLS system. Okay, I'll tell you uh, the takeaway for me today is it's all about graphs, 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 and take advantage of the declining market. We have we have not seen this type of situation in the 30 years I've been doing this. And, you know, we spent a lot of time on the graphs and I think somehow, some way, you need to take your graph in there and make that point. Yeah. Because we're gonna be showing graphs over and over and over again in our hearings. And I know Will is too. You bet, yeah. Yeah, I think that's huge this year. I think it's it's unprecedented, as you said, and it's it's ultimately an effect of, of, of interest rates. I mean, that'll be my main, you know, my key or my anchor strategy is, is uh, every, you know, everybody knows that these interest rates just spiked, you know, and there's a lot of concerns about inflation. Well, that cost, that took the cost of, of mortgages up and that slowed down a lot of transactions. So yeah. values fell and it's as simple as that. I, I know we have a lot of realtors on the call here and I don't think there's a topic. I think we did not get to this topic, but I had it on my list. Glenn, I'm going to ask you to address this. The prorated homestead that passed a couple of years ago as part of Senate mm -hmm. Bill 2, I think. In the past, to get a homestead exemption, you had to be own the house and occupy it as of January the 1st. And that's changed. Can you explain that? And then uh, we'll explain how that impacts the cap also. Sure. Go, go ahead, Glenn. Well, yeah. So now you don't, it's whenever you purchase the property, like the percentage of the year that you own the property is the percentage of the exemption that you get. So right now the ISD exemption is $40,000. If you purchase the property in June, let's just say you, that means you roughly own the property for 50% of the year. That means you're eligible for 50% of that homestead exemption. So you get 20,000 off. So that means you don't have to wait until next year to apply for that exemption. You should apply for it right away. If you if you've not applied for the exemption and you bought it purchased it last year, be sure on your homestead exemption form when you purchased the property and when you occupied it because that that could be you could be eligible for a refund on that because you should have been uh, eligible for a prorated portion of that homestead exemption from the previous year if you haven't already filed. Okay, so will let me give you an example. Let's say that I bought a house uh, last summer, July first of twenty twenty two, and I paid five hundred thousand for it. Um, does that set my homestead cap for the next year for 2023? No. No, it doesn't. That doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound fair. <laughs> I know well, it's right, but it doesn't sound fair. Explain <laughs> that. If you like. Sure, sure, sure. So a homestead rides with an owner. Okay. A homestead is tied to an owner and the appraised value for that tax year is established, you know, as of January 1, like we've been talking about, but once that value is certified, for that tax year, that will dictate the basis, if you will, that we're referring to. Okay. What so put another way, yeah, uh, Glenn, yeah. it's just kind of, this is a lot to unpack. So I think uh, yeah. you've used the, the, described it a little differently. Uh, yeah, there's different ways not, to describe that. Not, yeah. The, I have a lot of, I mean, we get this question. This is the number one question we get in our in our chat system on our website. You know, we have this live chat system and we're doing hundreds of chats every day. Um, and the number one question is for people that purchased their property last year. So I, I bought my property in 2022. I thought my value could only go up by 10%. Why did it go up by more than 10%? And, 
And the, the issue is, is you're not eligible for the homestead cap. So the exemption and caps are two totally different. The, the homestead exemption is, is separate from the homestead cap. Um, you're not eligible for the homestead cap the year after you purchase a property. So if you purchased it in 2022, your homestead limit is not, you, you're, you're, there's no homestead limit for you in 2023, meaning your property can go up by more than 10% in 2023 and likely it'll go up to what you paid for it. You know, because they got access to the MLS system, they're going to know you paid 500000 for it. They're going to know that you were at 400000 last year. The homeowner's expecting, okay, worst case scenario, I'll go to 440. The appraisal district says, nope, you're at 500. Homeowner's like, wait, I could only go up 10%. The appraisal district says, and this is not them saying it, this is the law. They're saying you're not eligible for that 10% cap the year after the purchase. So it'll automatically be applied in 2024. But if you just okay, buy a property, so, it's going to go up to what you paid for it more than likely. So if you bought a property in 2022, once again, 2023 is very key to protest that year because that sets the base for your 10% increase the next year. Am I getting that right? Yes. Because right. Another way to think about in summary of all of this is the, the tax, the, the first time that you've occupied the house as of January 1 ascribes your 100% residential homestead. Got gotcha. you. Gotcha. So maybe if you had a percentage of it a year before, well, that's not 100% and you haven't established your basis yet. So the first year that you were in the property as of January 1, that will determine your basis. And then it's a 10% from that every year thereafter. So and, the guy and that will, called, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, you can you can attest to this. People people last, so in 2021, let's rewind a year. In 2021, yeah. we get we have clients that, that purchased their property and we're going in and you know they're, they're showing closing documents and the appraisal district says, no, we're not going to lower it to what you paid because the market's gone up since then. You know, again, this was this was this was last year when we were just in the very hot market. Right. Well, conversely, conversely, this year I'm going to be arguing that our our clients should be valued lower than what they paid for it. Absolutely, because the market was declining. So it's it's yeah. it's it's the reciprocal situation that we were in last year, and the appraisal district had no problem at all denying people their purchase price last year and saying your value is higher than what you paid for. Well different story this year, complete opposite story this year. We're going to say they need to be valued lower than what they paid for because of the declining market. Yeah. yeah. In all fairness, you know, we've been kicking around the appraisal district is pretty good. I have seen several cases in Collin County where the appraisal district has valued the property at less than someone paid last spring. So um, I don't think, uh, I think they understand this, whether or not they'll agree with our time adjustments, I don't know, but I've seen enough cases where at least in Collin County, where they have sent a notice value at substantially less than what the property sold for in early 2022. So well, that's maybe another, that's some good news. Even before last year, you'd always hear this stuff about how, well, that's a, that sale was early on in the year. And, you know, these sales are later on in the year. Well, I'm certainly going to offer that in every County, you know, in every County, I'll be saying, you always tell me that you always say this one's later. Well, these are later in the year, you know, so you need to be paying attention to these, you know, and I'm going to hammer that for sure. Okay. Uh, guest, is there anything that you wanted to cover that we haven't covered? Uh, somebody came in. Somebody came in late and asked us to announce who we were again in our companies. I'm I'm Glenn Goodrich. I'm with PropertyTax.io, um, yeah. and we represent um, residential property owners protest their property tax. Will you, you go? Yeah, thanks. I'm Will Wiggins. I'm with North Texas Property Tax Service. Same thing. We commercial residential services for DFW. All right, well, what, what are your concluding there. what are your concluding thoughts, Will? Yeah, I, now that now that we're at the end, I get to I get to throw my two cents into the jar. Um, the monikers are frustrating me, the uh, as you know, guys, and so um, it's the appraised value. The homestead limited value is the appraised value, and it's on every notice of value, but it looks different on the different websites, and I think it makes people con con confused. You know, assessed and limited and taxable and blah blah blah, but. The one that the one that most people care about, of course, is the homestead uh, limited value, which is which should be dubbed the uh, appraised value. So that's my that's my two cents. <laughs> I I think we need kind of like a get out the vote effort for protesting. You know, we're preaching to the choir here. If you're attending this webinar, you you're, you're showing a high interest in protesting your value. What I would hope everyone would do is go on your neighborhood uh, online pages, like you know, next door, your Facebook community group. Even just conversation, good old fashioned conversations across the yard with your friends, but get people, get more people involved in this process. Um, 
the appraisal districts are, are rubber stamping a lot of a lot of values, and um, you know the appraisal district has an important role. We respect the appraisal district, but um, we need to be involved in that. More people need to be involved in that process. So if if you're part of this, please help spread the word to your neighbors. Encourage them. Um, if you can offer advice to them, do that also. Um, yeah. Well, is that slide of yours showing up there? Uh, sorry, Glenn. I it's the slide that you prepared. It, it about yeah, that. look, there it is. Yeah, you bet. Um, yeah, so if you didn't cover everything, just go feel free. To oh, well, thanks. In. I mean, yeah, it, it you know, it, we don't, it, we don't have to get it. I mean, this is the DCAD website and the Tarrant website, Colin website and the Denton one. You see on the Denton and the, and the column, they're calling the appraised and the appraised is the same as the market. And meanwhile, they're calling the homestead limitation the assessed value. Well, that's inaccurate because if you look at the same two counties, Denton and Colin, if you look on their notice of value, the assessed value is the appraised on the notice of value, which again, I just think it's confusing. I don't think they should do that. I think you should keep it con consistent is all I'm saying. But if you look at Dallas and Tarrant, you know, they both got it right that the, you know, at least, uh, well, Dallas is a little bit guilty too, because on the Dallas side, it just says capped. Okay. But if you look at a Dallas notice, it says appraised capped, right? Yeah. So, and then of course, Tarrant, they have it, they have it right as the appraised as the, is the capped value. But uh, that's it. I just get a lot of calls, you know, a lot of people throwing around a bunch of different words. And the, and the truth is, is that the homestead limitation, that limited value, that 10% limited value on all four counties, if you look at the notice of value, it's called the appraised value. And that's yeah. the way it should be. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think, uh, Anything else, Glenn? Any before we wrap no. up? No, thanks okay. everybody for attending. Um, again, uh, we we are open for business. I know Will is too. Um, so just come and chat with us. Or uh, Will, how should they get a hold of you? Yeah, easiest way is go to our website. All of our emails are on there. You can email me there. Uh, easiest way to sign up is through the website. And um, uh, what is the website domain? The domain. Thank you. It's uh, five letters. It's tough. It's N T P T S. Uh, that's Nancy Tom. Paul, Tom, Sam, dot com. We'll be happy to so have you. That stands for North Texas Property Tax Service, right? You got it. Yes, thank you. And, yeah. and my website is the same website that you're seeing on Jim's background uh, throughout. It's propertytax.io. So not dot com, but dot io, propertytax.io. All right. right. And, Shelby, um, anything? No, I was going to say thank you so much both for uh, for attending, giving all this information. Thank you, Jim, for uh, for moderating, uh, kind yeah. of roping together all of the, the questions. Uh, and according to the questions, there are a lot more that we haven't answered. And so I've been replying that we are going to uh, to tap the gentleman to answer as many of these as possible. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll include any duplicates, kind of combine them, but we'll like yeah. to post all this content on candystirt.com uh, with a, an, including a recording of this, uh, this webinar today. So I hope you guys got um, some value out of it. Uh, if you have any feedback, please let us know. Uh, feel free to, to email us. Uh, my email address is shelby at candystirt.com. I'm associate editor and I'd love to hear from you. So thank you guys all. Thank you panelists and thank you attendees. Thank you. Thanks thank everybody. You,